Well, good afternoon. Uh, let's go ahead and begin this, uh, this talk on uh, free trade and its enemies. <clears throat> uh, we'll divide the material into uh, two parts. First part, we'll just uh, make, make a quick overview of the uh, case for the market economy. So, you know, what do economists say? What's the basic um, reason why we should have laissez-faire? So we'll do that first. And then we'll uh, narrow the scope of the uh, argument to uh, also make the case for why one country uh, within a world of interventionist countries, why that one country should still maintain laissez-faire, what, what, ar what argument could be offered in that respect. <clears throat> so uh, that's what we'll do at the beginning. And then in the second part, we'll, uh, take, the, we'll take the enemies of, uh, of free trade or the enemies of laissez-faire. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, it's impossible to give an exhaustive list of all the enemies, right? It's just like uh, <laughs> their name is Legion. And so, uh, so I've just picked out some of the, some of the more prominent ones. Uh, and it covers uh, the history of thought. So, I, you know, some are being advanced now and some, some are old arguments. And uh, uh, so that's how we'll proceed. And maybe in the, you know, later in some of the, uh, uh, we had the panels uh, this afternoon that, you know, questions could be asked about other items that I, you know, uh, passed over. <clears throat> now, let me also make one uh, clarifying remark before we uh, jump in. And this is on the phrase free trade. Th this uh, phrase is uh, ambiguous in the literature. Uh, there's free trade in the narrow sense, and this is the way you would find it uh, stated most often in the economics literature, free trade just means the um, unimpeded movement of goods across political boundaries, right? Whereas capital and labor seem to be immobile, that they don't move between countries, right? So that's the kind of classic Ricardian case of what uh, in the literature is called free trade. I'd like to use the, the phrase free trade in the broader sense of just meaning free, free, <laughs> free trade, right? Free movement of... <laughs> You know, all, all things across, uh, across borders. So, so in particular, in other words, it would be not just goods, but also investment, ca capital movements are free in, uh, in a free trade regime. So, so I'm going to use that more expansive uh, definition. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, quickly rehearse the, uh, the case for the market economy. This is what we've been developing uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the week and what you've uh, you know, read about and studied about and so on. And the Austrians have a particularly, um, I think, um, uh, convincing uh, argument that you won't really find, uh, at least not uh, emphasized in the mainstream, that centers around, uh, as we talked about on Monday, this concept of economizing. In society, we want to be able to economize the use of resources. That's why we have an economy we want to be able to direct the resources toward the higher valued consumptive ends, and we want to uh, arrange the production processes in the lowest cost way, right? given our situation and the way we value things. <clears throat> and so um, following Ludwig von Mises, the argument is that uh, this economizing decision-making about the use of resources can only be done in a market economy. Uh, because if we don't have a market economy, then we're stuck with the problem of the impossibility of interpersonal utility comparisons. Right? And this we, we simply cannot do. And, and so the socialist economy is literally impossible in its pure sense, as uh, Dr. Salerno explained in an earlier talk. <clears throat> so in the market economy, then, we, we, have, um, we have the entrepreneurs arranging the division of labor by making economic calculations of profit and loss, for the different lines of producer goods, and economic calculations of uh, equity, net income, and, uh, from uh, investing in particular combinations of assets. That's how they know what uh, assets to bring into their organization and, and own, or which to disperse, right, and, and sell off. <laughs> how how uh, each entrepreneur combines the assets into an organization. And so both of those things can be done um, through appraisement by the economic calculations of uh, net income and uh, net worth. So, so this is the ba basic thrust of the argument. <clears throat> so the market economy then, if we have a pure market economy, if we have an unhampered market economy, then this process proceeds to the greatest extent possible. And then if we have any government intervention, 
The problem with this, of course, is that government intervention moves the co uh, control over resources away from the economizing decision-making of the entrepreneur and into the hands of bureaucrats who can't economize. Right? All, all they can do is make decisions on, on some political basis, some other basis, right? And so we lose the economizing uh, attribute of the use of those resources. They, they, they come outside of our control, right, as consumers, and they go into the uh, control of an elite who is sheltered from, the, uh, from our uh, con consumptive demands, dictating what should be used with those things. And, and so they're used inefficiently according to our consumptive demands, right? They're, uh, they can't be used in an economizing way anymore. <clears throat> so, th so this is the basic argument for the, for the uh, market economy. Um, and then, uh, and again, I said we could make this very quickly. And so then, then let's go on to this a uh, little bit more difficult uh, question. Well, what if we then don't have one like gigantic world unhampered market economy? That would be the ideal uh, social arrangement, of course, uh, from the economist's viewpoint. It would econom allow us to economize resources to the greatest degree uh, possible. <laughs> but what if we had different uh, countries, different polities, Right, and each polity then has its own uh, uh, political uh, decisions about interfering with this market process. <clears throat> well, w it it, uh, it uh, follows directly from what we argued before that the best policy for all of them to adopt, if they all adopt the same policy, the best policy for all of them to adopt is complete laissez-faire. Right, they should just do what what would be done if they didn't exist anyway. As states, you know, just leave, uh, you, know, uh, you know, let uh, the, the private property order develop along the lines of the entrepreneurial innovations, and then our ratification of these uh, these lines of production and investment according to our demands. Right? And then, then again, we'd get the same economizing result as if we had a, a world uh, as we started at first with totally unhampered. Right? We had no no uh, central economy at all. So again, that's not a very difficult. Uh, the point to uh, arrive at. The more difficult uh, point is this uh, question of what should we do in the real world for, in our country when we're surrounded by, uh, by uh, other countries that are belligerent and the states are belligerent, right? And they're intervening both domestically and maybe then with, with us in our countries. We try to trade or, uh, with them or invest in their country or allow investment right of their citizens into our country and so on and so forth what about that what, what should we do then should we retaliate should we uh, you know uh, should we go to autarky and right these would various options that we have <clears throat> now um, hopefully again it, it doesn't take you too much imagination to see that even in that world the best policy for us is laissez-faire the best policy for a for a country in a world of um, you know statist uh, uh, countries is still laissez-faire. Uh, it's still the best thing that we can do because, again, it means that given the restrictions that have been placed on us by state intervention uh, from the outside and given the natural restrictions, of course, th that always exist on human action, uh, if we adopt laissez-faire, we're still able to economize as best as possible, right? So, so there's, th this is a generalizable argument. There isn't, uh, Again, a lot of work to do here theoretically. This is just the same argument we would make with respect to a domestic intervention. In other words, if the government uh, intervenes and they c create, uh, you know, they subsidize electric uh, uh, vehicles, and this then uh, creates, uh, you know, a uh, uh, suppression of the uh, production of innovative uh, activity in, uh, in uh, uh, internal combustion engines like Volkswagen's great development of diesel-powered cars, something like this. Uh, you know Professor Terrell drives Volkswagens, diesel Volkswagens? He, uh, he has a little uh, Passat. He drove up in South Carolina and told me he got 51 gallons, uh, miles to the gallon. That's 2015 uh, uh, Volkswagen. That was the year they were banned, right? So he, <laughs> he picked one up right before the, you know, they got into the, all the big... Uh, problems, okay? So, so, so we wouldn't say, you know, hopefully you can see right away that it would harm us if we then said, well, because, you know, because domestically we've got this, uh, this uh, waste, as we see it, right, as subsidies of the, the battery power cars, that we then, you know, also, let's say, subsidize diesel uh, engine production, right? This is, that would be doubly bad. That would just mean now that we have two sources of 
uh, interference with the economizing activity of, of the government instead of just one. Right? It would, uh, to give you an even simpler kind of illustration, if I'm running a, a farm, let's say, and I'm, uh, uh, you know, one of my suppliers cuts me off. Uh, you know, he says, look, we're not going to trade with you anymore because uh, whatever, you're, you're too bourgeois or, you know, we don't like the way you dress or, you know, whatever it is. We're, we're, you know, my, my proper reaction to that would not be, because this would just harm my interest, right, to retaliate, so to speak, by saying, well, if you're not going to sell to me, I'm not going to sell to you. You know, I'm not going to sell you my pigs anymore. So forget you, right? This is hardly conducive to my own economizing. You know, I would only do that out of, out of psychological spite or something. This, the point is that this would not be a, a favorable to my own material uh, uh, activity. Right? So, so we can see this fairly readily. <clears throat> so, of course, we shouldn't retaliate. We should just be, uh, we should maintain laissez-faire in the face of this. Now, now, maybe if this, by the way, if this uh, claim doesn't seem obvious to you, that that's the point of going through the counter arguments, right? That's, that's the point of going through the arguments for protection. It, it, you know, may, maybe one of those guys or gals who made arguments for protection comes up with a, you know, a good uh, rebuttal to this claim. So, so that, that's kind of the path that we're going to uh, take. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's the, uh, uh, that, that, that's the uh, framework that we started out with. Okay, so now let's give a strict definition to what uh, I mean in the talk by protectionist policies. So the state in one country coercively interferes with market activity between uh, people in that country and people in other countries. So they, uh, you know, they uh, tax uh, imports, right, uh, that, are, that are sold by, the, by foreigners uh, to uh, people in the country. Or they put uh, quotas on, on goods that could be exported or imported, this kind of thing. And, and then, as I also mentioned, we want to include uh, capital controls. They, would, they might place, they might uh, restrict investment from foreigners into their country. No, 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 we, you know, we don't want any Chinese factories, right? Chinese owned factories. We don't, we don't want that uh, Kia plant over in Georgia or, you know, whatever, right? We want that to be American owned. <laughs> uh, that, that would be the idea. <clears throat> uh, and, and the flow of money too, right? We could have, we could have uh, controls on state intervention on the controls of money. So this is what we mean by protectionist policies. And as we, uh, we, we, uh, we're getting a uh, firsthand experience with this, of course, uh, with the Trump administration, we know, the, we know the rhetoric of this is always, we're gonna, by doing this, by imposing these protectionist measures, we improve our own citizens' well-being. And again, anyone trained in, in any uh, economics whatsoever uh, knows that that seems not quite right at the beginning, right? It seems like uh, something like this would only, would initially at least only help one group and then would harm another. That, that again is pretty easy to see, right? That, that it doesn't seem like society overall is made better off by these kinds of impositions. You tax uh, imported cars or whatever and yeah, you can see how that would help uh, domestic producers, but the consumers, how does it help them, right? And so, you know, so, so you have to weave these uh, apologetic uh, arguments, right? You have to weave, uh, protectionists would have to weave some sort of additional claim with respect to how this benefits society at large. This is the typical thing. Again, as we've seen in several talks uh, today, uh, uh, Dr. Klein and... Uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Newman, uh, you, you know, oftentimes this is just rhetoric. Right? They know full well what they're doing and that they're ripping us off and, and so on. But, uh, you know, we need to, as uh, intellectuals, we, we need to penetrate. We need, we need to see the truth of it, right, the truth of the matter, and uh, not concern ourselves, uh, at least primarily, with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the give and take of the interests that are pushing one way or the other. I mean, that, that uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Professor Rothbard, of course, was great at that, but that was sort of a secondary thing. That was sort of his hobby, right? To write about this progressive stuff and history. And that was, you know, what made him laugh and what gave him fun in life was to smash all those people. But, <laughs> but the actual intellectual work was to do the economics, right? To do the economics or to do the political philosophy, to get the, get the truth, right? We want to get at the, what's really real and, and so on. So, uh, so this, is, th this is our approach. Okay, so anyway, let's jump in. Uh, if we want to start with the historical case, at least in the Western world, we'd start with uh, mercantilism. And this has been uh, mentioned a few times. 
<clears throat> and as Rothbard uh, points out, uh, mercantilism, uh, which was the policy of, uh, of royal absolutism in Europe uh, from about the 16th to the 18th century, is what the British classical economists uh, overturned uh, uh, quite uh, dramatically with, with their work, and we'll uh, mention their arguments here in just a minute. <clears throat> and the, uh, the uh, protectionist element of this came in the wake of the success of the Spanish um, uh, mercantilists, who you may remember uh, exploited the uh, gold and silver mines of the New World by conquering and enslaving the natives. <clears throat> and they had this steady production of uh, gold and silver coin going into Spain from the New World, right? You had this money inflow. And it was coming, of course, since this was a government production operation, with slavery, and right? And the, the uh, ships were all owned by the state, and they took the stuff, or, or contra subcontracted <laughs> uh, by the state. And they took the gold back and silver back to, back to Spain. Uh, this, the crown got to spend the money. whoop de doo that seems great, right? And then they built their armada, and this didn't end well, right, for the Spanish. The Spanish, uh, you know, they had this empire, and then, pfft, where have they been lately? I mean, <clears throat> but when this was going on, it looked great to the other countries. Right, to France, to, to England, to the, to the monarchs of these countries. Now, uh, you know, Spanish had already gotten the mines, <laughs> okay, so they probably couldn't replicate this very easily, this, this particular system. But they thought, hey, look, we can just arrange uh, uh, international trade. We can just interfere in international trade to create money inflows. That's not, that, that's not hard to see how to do that, right? So, so this is where we get a protectionist policy that's designed to do what the inflow of money was doing for Spain to enrich them, to generate a boom at least. Uh, temporarily. So all you do is subsidize uh, your export industries, right, and tax imports, and then you'll be able to uh, render a favorable balance of trade, as Professor Salerno was talking about, which means that money will flow in, and then, well, you're, <laughs> you know, he, okay, so this is, this is, uh, we can replicate what's uh, the, the prosperity of, of the Spanish crown by doing this, right? So that was probably the first uh, sort of protectionist mercantilist doctrine. Now, as I mentioned, this was smashed by the uh, British classical economists, uh, and uh, leading the way here was David Hume. Uh, if you remember uh, uh, studying anything about the, uh, the anti-mercantilist uh, um, points that were made by the British classical economists, Hume was just fantastic on money, and Adam Smith was just terrible on money. But Adam Smith was really good on other stuff, other anti-mercantilist stuff, right? But not very good on money. It was, and maybe this was just because Hume had already done this work. But, but what, what Smith should have done, of course, is said, okay, here's my little section on money. See David Hume, right? <laughs> See David Hume's pamphlet on money. Now, it says it all. That's, but he, he had to go his own way and invent some crazy stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, Professor Salerno has already explained this about the, the so-called price specie flow mechanism. If you artificially create an inflow of money that isn't being demanded by people in your country, it's, it, you're not bringing in more money because money demand is greater by people in your country than it is in other countries, but you're just, you're just skewing exports and imports through protectionism. And as soon, as soon as people get the new money in the country, they'll spend it, they'll drive prices up, when they drive prices up, then your exports will fall, right? Because they become more expensive and imports will increase. And, and, and so it's self-reversing. This, this is the first example. Well, maybe it's not the very first, but it's a, a very prominent first example of a self-reversing process. The state intervenes in some way and then it, it, it actually sets in motion a dynamic that reverses the, the uh, effect of the initial intervention. The business cycle is another prominent example of this, right? Uh, governments, of course, can maintain certain physical expenditures, right? So they could prop up a big, you know, military industrial complex just by taxing us and spending the, uh, the uh, money, uh, the, the tax revenue on, um, you know, air bases and so on and so forth. Well, we know this, right? We see this ongoing. That's not self-reversing. That, that's a government intervention that can be sustained, right? At, at least in, in some degree. But here's one that's actually self-reversing. Nothing the government can do about this, as long as they allow trade, <laughs> they don't shut trade off completely, th this process will in fact occur. And it's just, it's self-refuting. Uh, it's, uh, 
There's no, no point in doing this, even from the perspective of the government officials. Hume also added a second argument here where he pointed out that uh, money is not like any other good in at least, well, a couple respects, but in this one respect, uh, if we have more labor or more uh, uh, usable lands area in society or you know, more and better capital goods or if we have more consumer goods, that's socially beneficial. This convey, you know, some people will be better off and none worse off, you know, depending on how the new goods are distributed. But if we have more money in society, it conveys no overall general benefit to people in society. Uh, to put the point a little bit differently, um, any amount of money is sufficient to perform the entire medium of exchange function in society at any moment in time, right? So if we had twice as much money, we'd make exactly the same number of trades. It's just that prices would be twice as high. If we had half as much money, we, we could make exactly the same trades if, as long as prices are half, half as high. And it, it, so you could see right away that having more money doesn't really convey any improvement in the social function of money as it does with other goods. And, and so, so uh, Hume is cutting, uh, undercutting this argument that, hey, if we bring in more money through this protectionist policy, it'll benefit society. No, 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 it won't benefit society because any amount of money is sufficient to perform the entire social function of money. And so we can't, you know, this, is a, this argument doesn't get started uh, uh, very well. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing to point out here is uh, we'll spend just a little bit of time uh, reviewing balance of payments accounts. This is an important point, again, that's been stressed by uh, Professor Salerno, in a couple of uh, uh, articles, not uh, not so much in the international trade area, but he's even shown that this is a the, uh, the uh, application uh, uh, can be extended from international trade where this idea arises. It can be generalized and applied to other areas. So, as he points out, uh, if we think about aggregate aggregates of spending like all consumption that we do together or all investment. We think in the Keynesian way about uh, you know, total consumption spending and so on. As he points out, these are not causal factors uh, in the real economy. These are effects of what's already happened in the cause and effect chain, right? So what happens is we, we have uh, you know, our property ownership and we have our social arrangements and right, our division of labor and so on. And then we, uh, we make expenditures, we have demand, and we buy things, and the effect of our buying is an expenditure, just like it's a revenue for the entrepreneur, right? And so on. So everything has to be kept in the, in the proper cause and effect sequence to see what the cause and effect uh, character of expenditures is. They're not, they're, not the, they're not the first step in the causal chain, right? I expenditures, do not cause the array of production. We, we, we have to put them in the right uh, place in the chain of reasoning. This is what uh, Salerno has pointed out. So it's the same with, with balance of payments accounts. So let's just quickly think this through. Um, let's suppose we receive uh, goods. Uh, th this is in any setting. We receive goods from the sale of things, or uh, excuse me, funding from the sale of things. So we sell something and we receive uh, funding in exchange, then what are our options in terms of disbursement of this income that we've earned by selling something? Well, we can buy goods and services from other people with our income that we've earned. We could buy real assets. We could buy a house, a farm, right? We could buy financial assets. So we could buy bo uh, bonds, stocks, uh, and so on. Or we could just hold the money. So these are our options, right? Uh, categorically, these are our options. And then as we engage in the particular actions that we prefer, I go out and I buy, let's say, uh, uh, I buy uh, Matt McC uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> Patrick uh, Newman's new book. <laughs> I'm, I don't need to buy Matt McCaffrey's new book because I get a free copy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I probably, I may not buy one, one of those, but uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, I, I buy that, right, I buy that, and then, and then I, that would go, you know, then when I'm sort of doing my personal finance, I, I put that under my consumption expenditure. Hey, I spent whatever, $75 on books. And then, you know, I spent $100 on gas last week or, you know, whatever it is, right? I, I can keep this journal of my expenditures. And I could do the same thing on the income side. You know, I don't, uh, the, the action that I take is 
I prefer the job that I have. I, I, prefer the, I prefer the compensation I get to the job that I have, right? So I take this job. That's my choice. That's, that's the primary thing. I have a preference and then I act upon it. And then as a result, I earn income, right? That, that's part of what's going on, but it's not the primary thing, right? It, it moves in a chain. So, th so this is the idea of doing a balance of payments accounts. So the first thing to notice is that a ba balance of payments account is like a journal of my expenditures, right? It's not a form of economic calculation by which I, you know, do appraisements and make, make decisions about production or, or uh, uh, you, you know, buying things in particular or something like that. Now, it, it, I'm not claiming that it's vacuous. I'm not claiming that I don't use it for anything, that it can't influence my decisions. I'm just saying it, it influences my decisions at the end of the, after I've done all this stuff, you know, and then I've tallied the result, then I can reassess by looking at this bottom line. I can, you know, say, oops, I maybe uh, $5,000 on books this month was too much. <laughs> maybe I had to, re, you know, reassess the particular things I'm doing. Maybe that's, uh, yeah, I drew the bank account down a little too far <laughs> or something like this, right? So, so you, you get the basic idea. There's a, there's a sort of logic to how these things proceed and then how we use them uh, in decision making. So what, so the main use we have, uh, you know, the main use you would have of a ledger of my expenditures or of a balance of payments accounts would be they reveal something about our preferences. You know, so you look at my ledger of expenditures and you know that I, I like books, you know, relative to other things. Uh, you, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm weird or geeky in that way, right? There's like compared to a, what other people's journals would look like, mine skewed heavily in this way. And, you know, not in that way. So to the, reveal something about my preferences. <clears throat> so, so this is the idea. <clears throat> uh, the other thing to notice about balance of payments accounts, and this is the same about income and expenditure accounts, right? They always have to balance. These are, these are accounting devices <laughs> that always have to balance, right? So we, that's why we call it a balance of payments accounts. It's a balance of payments accounts. So if we're, you know, if we have a merchandise uh, um, uh, uh, deficit in our balance of payments, we have to have a capital account surplus to balance it out, right? And the difference between those two things isn't arbitrary or, you know, uh, doesn't, uh, it's not a bad thing to have it one way or the other. It just reveals our preferences. That, that's the idea. So if, if we run a, uh, a balance uh, uh, payments uh, surplus with, I mean, if we run a merchandise uh, trade surplus with the Chinese, we import more from them and we export to them in goods, that just means that we, we like their goods relative to our own domestically produced more than the Chinese like their investments relative to ours. And so they invest more in our economy than they invest in theirs. And that, that's what, so it's always in balance, right? The uh, monetary sums are always in balance. There's, a, there's nothing, there's no uh, way that the balance of payments account should look. They just reveal our preferences. There's no good or bad way in which they should look. So, so that's the idea. Any more than we would say, you know, in consumption, you, know, you see the journal of my consumption that it's, it's good or bad. We're not speaking about it in an ethical sense. We mean for, for my sustaining my activity, it's not good or bad that I spend a lot on books. That, that's just my preference. Okay. So this is what a, a kind of stylistic uh, balance of payments account would look like. There, there's the uh, current account, which is, as it sounds, right, it's uh, short-term things, immediate or short-term transactions, uh, cash-related kinds of trades. And then there's a capital account, which are investments. And you can see in this example, this country has a merchandise uh, a trade imbalance, right? The merchandise trade uh, deficit. They're importing more than they export. So Trump would say, well, we gotta, you know, let's quit with the importing so much. It's awful. Let's put up protectionist barriers against these rotten Chinese and keep them from selling their stuff. We've got to get these jobs to the, we'll get to the jobs argument in a minute. We've got to get these jobs back to Americans. It's good American jobs, right? He would say that's a terrible thing. What economists say, uh, especially Austrians, stress this. It's not, a, it's not a good or a terrible thing. It's just, it's just our difference in preferences. Now, again, in our world, if this were a real balance of payments, of course, in our world, this is all messed up by various government interventions, right? And, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, try to grapple with that problem, too, as we go. Uh, okay, so if we, if we add up all the rest, there's service, uh, services that can be traded, and they have to be balanced, and investment income that's paid, right? These are ca uh, cash payments, uh, unilateral transfers. 
But on the capital account side, whatever imbalance exists up here, this 200 imbalance has to be balanced the other way with errors and omissions, right? It's balanced the other way. So if there is this uh, trade in merchandise imbalance, there has to be a capital inflow. And so once again, we don't think on the face of it that it's bad for our economy, it's bad for the you know, system of the division of labor that we have uh, Korean owned uh, auto factories or, right, or um, uh, you know, new, new, new plans for a Mercedes to build another factory in, in Alabama or whatever. We don't, we don't think, of, you know, how is that harmful to the operation of the division of labor? It doesn't seem like that. It follows somehow that just because the person has a different uh, a location where they live or something, that, that that makes a difference to the rest of us with respect to the economic activity. Okay, so this is the idea. Okay, so let's go on to the uh, uh, employment argument. So this is the one that Trump uh, harps on quite a bit, right? Let's uh, subsidize exports. <clears throat> um, and, and then, then we'll, uh, you know, run. This will be good for our uh, domestic workers, right? We'll, we'll generate more employment domestically, and um, uh, so, so we'll uh, we'll cheapen our exports, right? We'll we'll just uh, like uh, giving subsidies to Tesla, and so we'll make the price of the domestically produced good go down, and maybe foreigners will buy more, and it'll stimulate, you know, these good jobs among Americans, and we'll tax imports. Right, and that helps employment also uh, domestically. The argument runs because uh, then uh, domestic uh, producers will have to step up and you know produce. You know, we'll, sh we'll shift our demands toward domestic producers, and they'll have to step up and they'll provide jobs and so on. <clears throat> now, again, this is a very uh, old uh, argument uh, against uh, free trade that the classical economists dealt with, and uh, in sequence it went this, this way. Um, Adam Smith first pointed out that, uh, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. If we want to get a social benefit out of production, we need to have production uh, done by the efficient producer. It doesn't do any good to have production done inefficiently, right? That, that's, not, that's not helpful for uh, you know, the success of uh, people's real incomes. If they're producing things, you know, we give them jobs, but their production is inefficient. Uh, that, that would not seem a wise policy. It would be wasteful. This is what uh, Adam Smith, of course, was focusing on in the wealth of nations, right? He said, look, the wealth of nations is in real uh, production. It's in, it's in the real production processes and the real consumer goods that we enjoy. It's not in the monetary sums, right? It's in the real things. And uh, yeah, okay, so that's a good first step here. Um, uh, Ricardo came in and then strengthened this with his with his uh, law of comparative advantage, where he says, oh, "We can go one step further than this. Not only is it the case that uh, we should have efficient producers doing things, but we can show that uh, each person or each uh, area or what have you is the efficient producer of something. So, so we can't. So one country could never, uh, you know, put all people out of work in another country just by being physically more." Uh, efficient in all the production processes that the two countries engage in. Even that uh, is, uh, is incorrect. Uh, so this was the law of comparative cost or comparative advantage that Ricardo uh, advanced. And then, and then Ludwig von Mises made one more uh, uh, advance in this, on this line in what he called the law of association, <clears throat> where he showed that uh, this is actually a law that applies to each individual person and each individual factor of production, if we, we could apply the law or do the analysis for capital goods or land sites or uh, what have you. But, but if we want to do it for persons, then we see that it applies to every single person. And then Mises adds this other, so in other words, every single person is the efficient producer of something and so can find a position of employment. And so you're, you're not really changing overall employment when you impose these protectionist uh, measures, you're shifting employment around, and as Ricardo said, you're shifting it from efficient producers to inefficient. Let's you know uh, give another four point nine billion dollars to Tesla. I, right? This is the size of the subsidy so far. Th this is supposed to be healthy for the overall economy. You know, it's good for Elon Musk. It's good for his workers. They get high wages, right? But they're, but they're not efficient, and so we shouldn't, it's not good social policy to do this. It doesn't, it doesn't help the social order to do this, right? Even though it's just a, it revolves down uh, just then to a special interest. 
uh, okay, so that's the that's the uh, uh, employment argument. And then uh, prof, prof, uh, Dr. DiLorenzo dealt with this, the infant industry uh, argument, which was advanced by Al Alexander Hamilton. These, again, are sort of uh, 18th and 19th century arguments. It, they, they're still repeated today, right? But <laughs> economist work is never done. But, uh, but uh, they're old arguments. And uh, th this one is, uh, of course, that protection permits, uh, you know, infant in these uh, new emerging industries to uh, mature. Otherwise, it'd be squashed by the greater productivity of the, of the foreign producers. So, you know, if, uh, if the auto industry starts in the U.S., uh, and then we become, you know, big and efficient before the Japanese, let's say, start an auto company or the Koreans, then they could never, they could never compete with us, right? The government has to step in and shelter them. By the way, this is wrong on many levels. Hopefully, you see already that uh, with my example that that doesn't seem quite historically uh, plausible, right? <clears throat> uh, but anyway, the the uh, the points that economists have made against this, of course, are that only entrepreneurs can use economic calculation, that is, can be efficient in the selection of what industries to to uh, you know invest in and, and which ones not, right? Only they can tell when a emerging industry is going to be viable. Not, not government bureaucrats. Government bureaucrats, I think um, uh, Dr. Klein uh, gave a few examples in one of his earlier lectures about this. Um, it had to do with uh, whether the government back in the uh, uh, late uh, 70s or early 80s would have subsidized uh, uh, Bill Gates in his garage, right? Would they have done this? You know, to, as opposed to IBM? Oh, no, of course not, right? They're not going to pick uh, winners and losers, so to speak, uh, places to invest in, in an uh, economizing way. Now, the other thing to point out here is that uh, world, you know, sometimes the argument is made that, uh, well, you can never have a new auto company because the capital requirements are so vast to be efficient, it can never happen. This is just nonsense. This is like nonsense on stilts, right? What, where exactly, exactly does the capital funding come from to, for, for any investable project? And the answer is world capital markets. How big are the world capital markets? Well, the latest figures from, these are from uh, 2011. If you add up the GDP of the whole world in dollar terms, now, Again, I wouldn't put too much stock in the accuracy of the number, but it's a rough approximation, right? $70 trillion. If you add up world capital markets, all the bond markets, all the stock markets, all the uh, uh, derivative markets, all the bank loans, the capital value of all that, $216 trillion. Now, I dare say that any particular business can have adequate capital. <laughs> There's no lack of capital funding, right? There's just lack of convincing the capitalists that you've got a good project. Yeah, that's, okay, well, that's a problem. That's a, but that's a problem every, every entrepreneur has, right? If they go to the capital markets, they're all in the same position. They have to be able to say to the capitalists, lend to me, not to those guys, because I can generate this great product, earn this rate of return. You know, oftentimes, the, uh, you know, they talk a lot in the economics literature about the first mover advantage. But in a lot of industries, it's the latecomers that have the advantage. Because the newcomers have 20-year-old technology. And you're coming in, right, with brand new technology, and you're going to push them all out. Again, on uh, do a little bit more uh, bashing on uh, Musk. Uh, I, I've read, and I, and I don't know anything about the technology of this, so I, it could be just bogus. But I read a story that, oh, no, it must have been true because it was in the New York Times. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So this, this has got to be gospel truth. Uh, but anyway, the story said that uh, by the time Tesla's Giga battery factory gets actually producing the battery technology for doing the assembly process for those batteries will be antiquated. That's already just a dinosaur. And, and he's going to be put, you know, he's going to be pushed aside by the newcomers who come in the next five years with this new technology for how you assemble. It's much more efficient, apparently. So, whoops, right? It's not, uh, again, this doesn't seem to be much here in terms of the argument. Of course, we could point to numerous examples, I already alluded to this in the auto industry, of infants developing without protection. Uh, protection. It's a famous example of Honda <clears throat> in Japan that was uh, not only not subsidized, they were a little tiny uh, motorcycle company when they first got started in the late 50s. 
But they were expressly told not to go into auto manufacturing by the, by the government cartelized uh, you, you know, Japanese system, which uh, favored Toyota. And yet Honda is one of the great car companies of, of the world, right? <clears throat> so, so it's easy to you know, replicate these examples. Uh, what about the level playing field? So protection can allegedly uh, level the playing field so that the benefits of free trade can be kind of evenly, fairly distributed or something of this sort. As Mises points out, <clears throat> the market economy is not a game. Th this is the basic point. It's not a game. There's not, we, we don't need umpires. We don't need level playing fields. We don't need you know, rules or whatever of playing a game. We're not, we're, it's not a contest where we're trying to outcompete the other person in you know, winning a trophy or you know, showing that we're faster or at running or you know, stronger at wrestling or whatever. That, that's, not, that's not it. Um, the competition that exists in the market is always competition to cooperate with other people to satisfy their preferences more fully than your competitors are cooperating with other people. Right? The market is a system of social cooperation, as Mises like to emphasize. There's nothing, there's nothing like gamemanship in it at all, except in a psychological sense, that's fine, right? So in a psychological sense, people can think of it this way. <clears throat> but the actual reality of what the market is, is uh, categorically different from a game. And so obviously we don't need level playing fields, whatever that might mean, right? We don't need fair rules or w whatever these terms might mean, uh, because it isn't a game. And so it doesn't make any sense to apply these terms, these like, uh, concepts, to uh, social cooperation. <clears throat> uh, so, so this is the first point. And then as we've already alluded to, uh, e even if we think of it this way, as kind of a game where we're losing out because the other country's doing things that are unfair to our, uh, you know, they're subsidizing their producers or whatever. We've already seen that even if that's true, the best policy for us in our country is still laissez-faire. What? Because somebody, uh, you know, punches you in the nose, why should you break your own arm, right? I mean, what, what's the sense of this, we, right? We shouldn't injure ourselves just because someone else injured us. So this is the idea. Uh, here's another one that it, I, I don't think is, this one is, uh, it's, uh, there's some literature on this, but actually, um, uh, we hope there's going to be some new literature on this. <laughs> so Dr. Engelhart uh, and Dr. Block and I are actually writing a, a paper currently on this very question of whether, whether a laissez-faire country can be relatively insulated from international booms and busts. So, but the common view, the, the sort of standard conventional view is that if you, if, you, uh, uh, if, if you have a country and it's embedded in other, you know, an international economy with other countries that are engaged in monetary inflation and credit expansion, then you, you want to put up protectionist barriers to prevent that uh, from you know, prevent the business cycle from being imported into your country. You want capital controls and uh, controls on uh, uh, trade uh, movements so that you don't experience, get integrated into this, right? <clears throat> uh, now, there are a couple of arguments that uh, uh, stand against this. And uh, one of them has to do with this uh, point again that Professor Salerno was talking about. What if we had a gold standard country? What if a country stuck to a pure gold standard? that the argument will run would uh, insulate that country from certain dimensions of the boom bust cycle. For example, there could be no domestic credit expansion and therefore the, at least this country would not get caught up in its own domestic version of the international credit expansion. Um, since it's a gold standard country, the, the foreign uh, um, currencies would devalue in exchange uh, markets against the sound money country. And again, this would provide some degree of insulation of the sound money country to, to the booms and busts generated in other countries. And then finally, we, uh, another point, and we're not quite, <laughs> by the way, we're not quite finished in thinking through all the arguments here that this is a pretty uh, complicated uh, question. But another uh, area where we're making a claim is that uh, uh, the, the actual distortions then that will begin to come into a sound money economy will be specific to the assets along the lines of the Cantillon effects of the boom in the rest of the world. So if you had a country that's produce, producing, let's say, lithium, they had lithium mines, and let's say there was a big boom in battery production from credit expansion in other countries, then lithium, there, there'd be a lot of interest in investing in lithium mines, 
right, or in buying lithium in this sound money country. But it's precisely because the, the uh, business cycle effect comes along the line of particular goods that entrepreneurs in that line can sort of identify roughly that they're in a boom. And then they can just hold back, right? They, they don't have to malinvest. The price of the, the, price of the uh, lithium is going to go way up, and they're going to earn a lot of profit in the interim without overexpand, you know, malinvest, opening up new mines that go bust later on. This just becomes then an entrepreneurial question that perhaps they can deal with at least better than they could in other countries that don't have sound money. So this is not particularly, at least we don't think this is particularly problematic. By the way, I, I should say, it's just for full disclosure, we're not saying that no effect would occur, right? We're not saying that certainly there can, there will be, you know, some distortion in the sound money economy. We're saying to, to a large extent it can be avoided. <clears throat> There's the national security argument. So, uh, you know, if we integrate our production with other countries and we become dependent upon them and then, oops, now we've got a problem if we go to war. They'll, you know, uh, blackmail uh, us and withhold their supplies. Again, uh, th this seems like a problem on the face of it, but when you think it through in a general sense, you see right away that this there, this is not very um, this is not very convincing, because this is just a sort of speak general problem that we all have when we interact with each other in the social nexus, right? We all rely upon each other. I don't grow my own food. I'm I'd starve to death if people quit selling to me. You know, what, why don't I just, uh, you know, uh, protecting it? Why don't I put up barriers around my house so that uh, I become self-sufficient in these things? Why isn't that my right reaction? Well, no, this is not the right reaction. Uh, of course, we can depend upon each other because there's mutual advantage in these arrangements. And, and um, this creates a kind of um, reliance, some degree of reliance then that we can have upon the plethora of other people who will supply us if one of them becomes our enemy, right? And says, look, I'm not going to give you your food, but there are other grocery stores in town. <clears throat> uh, also, free trade, of course, does not mean that people... Um, uh, uh, well, it, it means that people are free to use their own judgments with respect to who is reliable. In other words, what, what we want is for entrepreneurs to do this, not government officials. Because when government officials do this, as we're seeing played out in the Russian sanctions and so on, this all just resolve itself down to petty disputes, personal grudges, right? Intrigue of politics as to who our enemy is and who isn't and who we align with and where we get our supplies from and so on and so forth. Entrepreneurs don't make their decisions in this fashion. They, they judge the reliability of their different suppliers, and then they won't deal with these people who think are unreliable, especially in times of trouble. They'll know how to switch. They'll stockpile goods if they think, you know, there's going to be a disruption in the market. They know how to hold inventory and so on and so forth. We just think it, uh, as economists, we think it's a better way to deal with, we don't deny the problem. We just think it's a better way to deal with the problem, to leave the market uh, open. And then let me say at the last, uh, this last point about politicizing, you know, if politicians were really concerned about national defense, well, don't you think they'd be a little bit more efficient in the production of national defense? I mean, what is the biggest boondoggle industry in the, in the whole economy? It's the military industrial complex, right? And, and other government, you know, big government projects like road building and infrastructure and so on, the very things that Trump is uh, trumping. Right? Uh, or should I say trumpeting? Trumpeting. Yeah, he's trumpeting all this stuff that we, well, we know it's super inefficient. I mean, if they, really, if they really cared about us, wouldn't they you know, at least strive to be a little bit more efficient? It would seem that this would be uh, uh, you know, some strike against uh, giving up laissez-faire into the hands of uh, uh, government, uh, government officials. Well, I had a few more of these, but I've already gone over time, so sorry about that. We'll quit here and then I'll take a break. Thank you.